Hello, my name is Paula Deming, and when I sit down to play a board game, 61% of the time, it's going to be a two-player game. And I think a lot of people are like me and only have one friend or loved one willing to put up with them at a time. I mean, find themselves in a situation with only one other person to play games with, for whatever reason. Don't read too deep into it. And so I've put together a list of my top 10 two-player games. For this list, I tried to limit myself to games designed with just two players in mind, even though this is four. Just two players in mind. No other player counts allowed. Get out of here, three. No one wants to see you around here, four. Okay, so there might be like two games on the list that technically don't quite fit that criteria because they can be played in teams, but... Let's start with some quick fire honorable mentions. If any of these pique your interest, you should go check them out. Maybe they'll end up on your personal top 10 list. Try Tea for Two. Be a tea merchant. Gorgeous production, dice worker placement, and manipulation. Longhorn. Yeehaw, it's abstract strategy. Be an outlaw. Force your opponent to make plays that are bad for them and good for you. Marrakesh, with a CH, not an SH. Roll to move, but like it's actually good. Make an island of rugs. Force your opponent to make plays that are bad for them and good for you. Also, the rugs are actual bits of fabric. Watergate. Historical simulation. Feels like a tense tug of war. Lots of take that. Asymmetrical powers and hand management. Now that we've quick fired those honorable mentions, pew, 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 let's get on to the main list. But first, I need some tea to enjoy while I talk about games in Mini World's Tavern makes tea for the tabletop, so they're a perfect choice and a sponsor of this video. I'm brewing some Sage's Gate, which is a lavender mint sage tea, and it is genuinely one of the most delicious teas I have ever had. If that doesn't sound like your jam, they have eight other tea varieties, and I really want to try the Golden Roots, which is a turmeric ginger, and Spiced Sands, which is their masala chai. Let's be real, sometimes gaming can be stressful and a nice cup of tea is the perfect way to make your mind all cozy while you're crushing your opponent. Mini World's Tavern also makes coffee for game night. Of course, you've heard me talk about it before and how much I enjoy their coffee. They also have cat stickers, so you know they're good people. Further proof of that, they donate $1 per bag they sell to gaming-related nonprofits. So go check them out. And a big thank you to them for helping to sponsor this video. Now. Let's talk two-player games. The first game I want to talk about is Caper Europe. Now, full disclosure, I've done lots of work with Keymaster Games, the publisher of Caper Europe, and I did make the official how to play video for the game. But that is not why it's on this list. It's on this list because it's a really good two-player game. This re-implements the game Caper from 2018, which I've never played, so I don't know how different it is or isn't from the 2022 version but I do know that I think this is a really fun game for two people to play. You're both playing as criminal masterminds trying to pull off the best heist by gathering the right crew with the right equipment to steal the right stuff. You're drafting cards and activating their special powers when you play them, scoring for area control of the three different caper locations, for set collection of cards and set collection of stolen goods. It's a really tight game that feels tense, especially with the drafting because you're potentially giving your direct opponent cards you want or cards you don't want them to have and you don't know if when in the next turn they pass them back to you is what you were hoping would still be there. Is it still there? Can you take it? Also, the production value of this game is so good. It's just, it's visually pleasing. Like everything that Keymaster does, honestly and all the different European cities in the game have different rule sets and powers, so there's a lot of replayability. My tea is so hot. Undaunted Normandy is the ninth game on the list. I've chosen this one from the series specifically because I like it better than Undaunted North Africa, which might just be because I've played Normandy more, and I haven't had a chance yet to try Undaunted Stalingrad, but I'd really like to. Anyway, 
This game combines wargaming mechanisms with deck building and it is a great way to dip your toes into the style of war games and see if that's a pond you'd like to wade deeper into. The game has a campaign of scenarios that are historical simulations of World War II battles and you're building a deck of troops and placing chits on a board to achieve objectives and you're making tactical plans and rolling the dice and watching all those plans go to pot. It's really fun. <laughs> It's got a lot of luck. It's not too heavy, especially compared to more traditional war games. The line of sight rules are really easy to understand and I just really like it. And all the troops on your cards in your deck are named. So it's really kind of sad when they die. Mythic Mischief is number eight and Ivy Studios, who makes it, might be becoming one of my favorite publishers. So like Keymaster, they put so much care into the visuals and production quality of their games. And that's something that just, it really appeals to me and enhances my gaming experience. In Mythic Mischief, you are a student at a magical school, moving around the library, avoiding the Tome Keeper while trying to get other students caught by the Tome Keeper. It's an abstract strategy game, but it's so thematic. There's a ton of different factions or cliques you can play as, um, the trolls, which are the theater kids, the Frankensteins, who are the jocks, the ghosts, who are the artsy kids, etc. Every faction has slightly different powers and special moves, and your abilities upgrade during the game. It is a brain burner and can be prone to overthinking a turn because you're trying to figure out the most efficient way to manipulate the board, your pieces, your opponent's pieces, and the tone keeper to score as many points in one go as possible. It's such a puzzle, and when you know you've had a super efficient turn, it feels really good. The seventh game on this list is Space Hulk, the fourth edition from 2014, or is in, in one place it was listed as a re-edition of the third edition. I don't know why that's not a fourth edition. I don't, I don't understand that. So I'll be honest, I don't know if this is something you can actively purchase from Games Workshop. I'm actually pretty sure you can't. But I'm not going to let that stop me from putting it on this list because I like it. This game is set in the world of Warhammer 40k. It, you, you don't need to know anything about Warhammer really to play. It's got really cool miniatures, of course, because it's made by Games Workshop. That's pretty much their jam. And a modular board that can be built differently according to the scenario you're playing. So two players go head to head with one being the Space Marines and one playing the Gene Stealers. And they play with totally different rules. The space marines are exploring a derelict space vessel, and the gene stealers are there too, moving around the vents, waiting for just the right moment to show themselves and destroy the space marines. It's got a bit of a vibe of the movie Aliens. One thing I really like about this game is the asymmetric gameplay means you can play with people of different skill levels. So the Space Marines, in my opinion, are more complicated to play with more moving parts to keep track of. And the Gene Stealers, who I like to play, have a much simpler rule set that's less about puzzling out your tactics and more about surrounding and overwhelming. You can play the side that fits your skill level or strategy preference, and the other person can play the side that fits them, and everyone can be happy while playing the same game. And so one of you loses then there, there might be less happiness. Game number six is Lost Cities. So this is a game I heard people talk about for a long time and I was kind of a snob, I guess. I thought it sounded and looked boring. And at the time, I didn't really understand the appeal of set collection, which is a, what this game is. I have since learned the error of my ways. <laughs> because when Matthew Jude finally got me to play this game a few years ago, I was immediately so taken with it. It's so simple, play a card, draw a card. That's your turn. The theme is fairly abstract, but you are explorers trying to send expeditions out to lost cities. And those different locations are represented by different card colors. And you have to play those cards down to their matching locations in sequential order from lowest to highest. So first I play the green two, then I can play the green three, then I can play the green four. But once I've played the green eight, I can't go back to play the green six, right? You get points based on the values of the cards you play at each location, except as soon as you play down a card to a location, you incur debt 
it's the cost of the expedition, which means immediate negative points. You have to now make up with your card values and you're just holding out because you've got a two and a three already played and the five is in your hand and you really wanna be able to play the four, but it keeps not showing up. Every time you draw a card, you have to play and then draw. So you're like forced into making a decision. Finally, you give in to the inevitable. You play the five, draw a card, and it's the four. Every single time. And that feeling, along with holding back a card you know your opponent wants, but it's in your hand, you're not going to give it to them. I mean, that's what makes this game so good. Game number five, Warhammer Underworlds. This is like a whole series of box sets, but it's, it's called, overall, it's called Warhammer Underworlds. I like miniatures games, and I think this series is one that is really approachable, especially for people who've never played a tactical skirmish game before. It's got lots of things in it that will feel familiar to board gamers, and in a way that's similar to Undaunted, this could be a good way to test out to see if these kinds of games are something you might like. Underworld's games are pretty quick. They play in three rounds, and each war band has like six minis. They vary a bit. They don't all have the exact same number. And you have a board with hexes, so you don't need to worry about like measuring movement or making terrain. So that's really approachable. And you play cards to do actions and activate special powers for each of your minis and roll dice to attack or defend. And you have a deck of objectives you can draw from and try and score. So your goals might be different from your opponent. And at the end of three rounds, whoever scored the most objective points wins. It's fast paced, so if you end up with a bunch of bad dice luck, you aren't stuck in a losing game for like hours. It's way simpler than something like Kill Team or 40K or Age of Sigmar. And I really like assembling and painting the minis and the mental load of the game really isn't too taxing, which is just right for me and my brain. Though Board Game Geek does rate it, it's like a 3.7 something. I mean, that's not that light. It's fine. I'm like slurping at my tea because it's still so hot. Jiper is the fourth game on the list. And oh, I just, I think it's really good. You're a merchant collecting goods and trying to sell them to become the wealthiest merchant. The trick here is on your turn, you can either take one card from the market, trade two or more cards from your hand with cards in the market, or sell a set of cards that's in your hand. Different goods have different values, and the person who sells the goods first gets more for them because the points tokens that you get for selling go down in value as more of them get taken. But you also get bonuses for selling larger sets in one go. So the game is this really tight and stressful tightrope of holding out as long as possible before you sell those spices because you wanna try and sell four or five at a time to get the bonus. But if you wait too long, your opponent will sell spices first and get the best points tokens. Oh, and you have a seven card hand limit. So you can only hold so much while you're pushing your luck, waiting for the right card to come out. I'm getting worked up just thinking about it. It's quick and light and fun and great. Game number three, is Memoir 44. This game has been in my collection for basically the whole time I've been playing board games. I will never get rid of it. It's another game of historical World War II simulations. <laughs> Each scenario is a different battle from the war that you're playing out with specific victory objectives you're trying to achieve to win. You have a hand of cards that tells you how and where you can activate your troops on the board. Movement, again, is hex space, so it's really simple and you're rolling lots of dice to attack your opponent, which means if bad luck frustrates you, you might not have a great time with this game because sometimes the dice just aren't on your side. Not that that ever happens to me. But I also think that's what makes the game exciting. It's unpredictable, and maybe your game of this battle turns out differently than it did in history because of that. You can get some great cinematic story moments out of like the one single troop left in the hex who just won't die. He's a hero. Also, if World War II or war or historical stuff like isn't your jam, this same game system with a few tweaks is used in the game Battle Lore, which is fantasy creature battles. So that might be something to look into if that's a more exciting thing for you. The penultimate game, number two, it's Targi. Boy, this game is good. I really love it. Now, this game can be quite mean because you're going to be blocking each other a lot and often, not even on purpose. You're gonna have a turn and you're gonna do something, the other person's gonna be like, oh, that's where I wanted to go. And you're like, I did not even, 
I just needed to go there. But I never get upset about it in this game because I know going in that that's just part of it. In the game, you're gathering resources that you use to spend on tribe cards that you collect and put down in a tableau. You score points printed on those cards, but you also get bonus points if your row has all the same type of tribe card or all different types of tribe cards. But how do you get those cards? They're laid out in a grid with a border of action cards around them. So you take turns placing one worker on one of these border cards. Once both players have placed all three workers going back and forth, you see where your workers intersect. So I have one here and I have one here and I'm like, oh, they intersect on this card. And you place a little marker on it and that's an action you're going to get to do on that turn. If it was a goods card, you replace it with the tribe card for the next round. And if it was a tribe card, you replace it with a goods card for the next round. The competition for the best spots for your workers to get the best cards is tight and it can get pretty fierce. It's the kind of game that stresses me out, like in a good way. It has me like shaking my fist at my opponent a lot. If you don't mind direct player conflict, which honestly has been everything on this list, you should really try this game if you haven't yet. The worker placement mechanism is really unique and y'all, it's so fun. Honestly, talking about it right now is making me want to stop filming and go play it. My number one two player game is an abstract strategy game about time travel with a light campaign narrative and boxes of goodies to unlock and it's that time you killed me. You and your opponent are rival time travelers trying to erase each other from history because one of you invented time travel and it's gonna be you, darn it. So you have three boards, one that is the past, one that is the present, and one that is the future. And you start with a copy of you in all three, which is just a little pawn. On your turn, you choose one of those copies to do two actions with move one space, time travel forward, or time travel back, which leaves a copy of yourself behind. The goal is to use your movement and other bits that are in the game, no spoilers, to cause the death of your opponent's copies and like wipe them out of the board so they don't have any left they can play. And there are little things in the design of this game that make it such an engaging puzzle. Like the most you can move in one turn is two spaces if you use both your actions doing it. And because of the size of each era board, that often leaves you vulnerable to the other player. And you can't act in the same era two turns in a row. And you have to choose what era you're acting in next turn at the end of your current turn. So I'm like, well, I acted in the present right now. I'm done. Now I have to commit next turn. Am I going to act in the past or the future? And then I choose. You're trying to set yourself up and enact all these ripple effects through time to get the better of your opponent. It's really good and, and it's really tricky and more rules and variations get introduced as you play through the game, making it more and more interesting each time. And the components are nice and it looks good. Narrative abstract strategy. What? I, I really, really like it. And that's it, my top 10 two player games. I hope you found this list enjoyable and maybe you learned about some games you didn't know or hadn't been motivated to check out yet. I am always looking for more two player games, so if there are others that you enjoy, I would love to know what they are down in the comments, especially cooperative two player games. I didn't have any of those on this list. Mostly, I think because most co-op games aren't specifically two player only, so they didn't fit the criteria. Thank you again so much for watching. If you'd like to support what I'm doing here on the channel, you can check out the merch that's available in partnership with themeets.co, links below. You can make sure you're subscribed here to the channel and you can support my Patreon, patreon.com slash things get dicey. Thanks again to Mini Worlds Tavern for being a sponsor of this video. See y'all back here soon.